Okay. What's up, everybody? Welcome to day 25, a very special Memorial Day edition of the I'm Curious to Know project. I am pleased to welcome my guest today. Uh, Mark Hodelik is the CEO of tw uh, 29 and 29. And we, uh, I had the privilege of sharing his story a while back now, a couple of years ago. Um, we've become fairly close since then. I've had the privilege of working with Mark over the last year to bring some amazing stories from his event to life. Um, but without further ado, Mark Hodelik, welcome. Trav, thanks for having me, buddy. Excited to be on here. I appreciate you showing up. Uh, I know you've got a lot going on. I know that uh, the kids are probably out there waiting to go for a swim, but uh, you've made the time and effort, and I really appreciate that. I want to give a bit of context and a bit of background on kind of how we first met. And we did share uh, your story on twenty um, on on Inner Voice uh, through a mutual friend, Rob Moore. He sent me a text. He's like, "I've got this guy. He's an amazing athlete. He ran co uh, he ran in in college. He started this event series called Twenty Nine or Twenty Nine. Uh, you guys should talk." So we connected, we shared your story. I fell in love with the story. But what I really took most from that was uh, you're an innovator. You've created this amazing event, but also you're an amazing dad and you're an amazing friend and you spoke so highly of your family. And that's what really resonated with me about you. Um, tell me about your experience. What did you kind of take away from being able to share your story on Inner Voice and, and get that, you know, get that out there? Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, you threw a lot of accolades out there. I want to bring it into context that I was I was a pretty damn good high school runner in Alabama, and I wasn't that great in college. So, uh, but but yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've been a runner and an endurance athlete for a long time. That's kind of how I'd always identify myself. Uh, I just want to be a runner when I saw my dad running. I think when we had our conversation and Rob introduced us, I didn't realize how emotional it was going to be for me. Uh, I certainly had a wonderful experience running Leadville and finishing that race. And you've had people on who've had much bigger and more profound athletic accomplishments. But I think for me, it was, it was eye opening, uh, how much that finish line kind of meant to me and my family, but mm -hmm. I kind of checked the box and moved on to the next thing and really hadn't spent the appropriate time to kind of reflect. And, uh, there was a lot of almost, uh, real time journaling that happened, uh, when we had our discussion. I didn't realize how many things I had inside of me that I knew was motivating me on a day to day basis and that, you know, maybe I thought about during the actual race, but actually came to light and we actually had our conversation. So a lot of thanks to you for being so insightful and, and, and asking a lot of those right questions and knowing, knowing what to pull on. And uh, I would certainly say that that experience um, from Leadville, my first Ironman, those getting into endurance sport has certainly played off very well in, in my ability to want to give that experience to others through 29 out 29. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's take a step back. I want to talk about Leadville and Ironman and those type of things a little bit more, but let's take a step back to really discuss and talk about 29 or 29. Um, Everesting is, is really having a moment in time where, you know, I had Till Schenk on the show. He did a, an Everesting on Zwift a couple of weeks ago. I had Emma Grant on the show. She did an Everesting to raise money for No Kid Hungry on Mount Lemon in, uh, in Tucson, Arizona. This is different. This isn't riding your bike on a trainer or up a mountain. This is completely different. Why don't you give us the the backstory or how 29 or 29 came to be and a bit of an idea of what it actually entails. Yeah, I think, look, you have a lot of amazing cyclists, a lot of amazing endurance athletes on here who know Everstein from kind of a singular challenge that takes place uh, in the biking world, in the cycling world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had kind of heard about it just anecdotally and uh, had kind of known that there was this group in, in I think Australia or New Zealand, uh, the mm -hmm. Hell's 500 or something like that, that had actually come up, kind of come up with the concept and had seen maybe one or two things on Strava. And that's kind of the extent of what I knew about it. Had gotten to be friends with my, my business partner, Jesse Itzler, who had this amazing backyard race where people would run up a hill in his backyard a hundred times and down it. And it was just, it was how he threw a party. And when we decided we wanted to do an event together, we were kind of talking about all these different concepts. And I thought, well, you know, you have this amazing concept of what you're doing in your backyard, but it's around the number 100. And it's, it's a very hard event, um, a little bit more anaerobic. And it's, uh, you know, the, the winners do it in less than two hours. And I was thinking, well, what about a very long duration event where you actually really need to train for a very long time for it? And you're going to be faced numerous times, not with the number of 100, but, and we started thinking about, I was like, well, how many vertical feet do people get in your backyard? And he didn't know and, and kind of going and figuring out and then thinking, well, how hard it would be to get 10,000 vertical feet, 20,000 vertical mm -hmm. feet. Could anyone do 29 and 29 on foot? And then how would it be done? And the interesting thing about the mm -hmm. bike is, you know, you ride up and you have your own mode of transportation down. 
So the kind of the first hurdle we had across was, look, it's really getting to be too much like an ultra, a 100 mile ultra if you have to go up and down off foot. And Hard Rock's already doing that and Leadville is akin to that. And you have some races where you actually will get 29,000 feet of gain and loss, but you're covering 100 miles. Mm -hmm. And the real thought was, you know, how do you get something that's such a big challenge? The name Everest just means so much to so many people. It's the pinnacle. It's the highest point on earth. It's, you know, uh, Colin O'Brady, a, a friend of ours and phenomenal world uh, explorer and endurance athlete. You know, he asked, what's your Everest? And, and so I think, you know, for us all, we want to put something big on our calendar. It was thinking, how can we put something on the calendar as big as accomplishing? Can we get 29,000, 29 vertical feet on foot? How do we also do that to where it's, it's doable, it's approachable, and it's not about competition. It's not about doing mm -hmm. it faster than someone. It's not doing it in more extreme conditions. It's about lifting each other up and seeing if we can all do this together. And what I really realized was that hiking is something that people of varied athletic backgrounds, varying fitness levels, and from all ages can do. And your ability to do it for a very long period of time in a row, 10, 12, 14, 20, 30, 36 hours, if you have a 36 hour challenge is highly doable. If you give people an environment that's uplifting and mm -hmm. is conducive to keep going. So the, the idea there was partner with ski resorts, hike up the mountain, take the gondola down and be able to continue to repeat that as many times as possible with the ultimate goal of being to climb 29,000 and 29 feet. Yeah. You, and you alluded to it. I think that the, the most beautiful thing that I've seen is the ability for people who are not necessarily endurance athletes that don't come from a background of endurance athletics or endurance sports and with some dedication and focus on the training and preparation they're able to complete this event and it is truly life-changing for them um tell me about some of those examples where you've seen people you know turn their life around through this particular challenge in this particular event sure i think without singling out specific names i think there's just some specific or, or some general stories that i that i find really compelling the first is, and I oh, to use the name is my wife, Stacy. You know, she'd never done more than a 5K. And, you know, after we did the first year's event, she said, well, this is something I want to do next year. And I was shocked because it, you know, to have never even done more than say 25 minutes of racing and then want to go into an event that most likely is going to take her 30 plus hours is a huge jump. Most people go 5K, 10K, half marathon, marathon, maybe ultra marathon, 50K. And then maybe eventually after years ago to a hundred miler. And, it, it spoke to her in a way of she's been supporting me. She's been supporting our kids in all our athletic events. And this was something she felt like she, like she could put on her calendar and have us support her. And it felt doable to her. She put in the time and that she had the belief that she was going to have a support system surrounding her, not only in our immediate family, but the broader 29029 family on the mountain, because she's not racing mm -hmm. other people. It's not how fast she does it. It's just if she can keep going. So that to me was one that was very personal to see my wife put something that big and to get the benefits uh, firsthand that I've gotten from endurance sport, but, but others who are facing, you know, uh, oncoming cancer treatments and deciding to come to the event and say, this is a way I'm going to harden my mind and surround myself with positive people and give myself some tools for a much bigger Everest that I have in front of me to mm -hmm. gentlemen who've come to the event. Uh, we have a gentleman coming to the event for the third time this year, and he still hasn't finished. And when I mean finished, I mean getting to 29,000, 29 feet, but he's gotten all the benefits of the event by getting one more climb doing one more round than he thought was possible. And those to me are the most uplifting things are seeing people come to the mountain with one, with one perception of themselves and leaving, looking at themselves in an entirely different light. And the reason mm -hmm. that they, they leave and looking at themselves and they look at themselves in a mirror a different way the next day and for the rest of their lives is because they did something that was so challenging, not necessarily physically, but mentally, that it brought them to a place where they had to decide if they were going to quit on themselves or not. There was yep. every availability to quit as possible. You know, when, when you're at mile 70 of a hundred miler, it's not that easy to quit because there's no bus to take you home. You're in the middle of nowhere. And I don't mean to diminish the, the, the agony sometimes that you're going through. It's just when you're on, on a, on a wonderful mountain and there's music playing and massage therapists, and there's these luxury glamping tents at the base of the mountain you're challenged about every hour and a half to decide, do I go and rest or I keep climbing? And you have to mm -hmm. constantly make those decisions. I think to have people continually choose to lean in and to choose to kind of face the unknown continually, you are going to get better. You're gonna learn things about yourself that you're gonna like. And you're probably mm -hmm. gonna see some things about yourself that you don't like, the excuses that come up in your head, uh, that all the different things you can think about in the moment to justify why you should stop. But so long as you continue to go, that just makes that lap, that hike, 
um, that summit that much more rewarding. And, and that to me is the essence of 29 to 29. Is it bringing you to a place where no matter what level of athlete you are, you're going to want to stop and you continually get to make that decision to keep going. And when you get and when you keep going, you will leave a better version of yourself. Yeah. You talked about um, beginners or you talked about people who potentially haven't had that experience, but there has been a, some really amazing examples of people who have had experience. You've had Olympians, you've had world record holders, you've had Ironman um, athletes, you've had people with endurance experience who have also been able to be successful in a different way at this event. They're not looking over their shoulder, they're not looking at their time, they're not wondering who's chasing them, but they can have this outstanding um, feeling of achievement because no matter which way you you um, you you split it, you're still spending a significant amount of time on your feet to get to 29,000 feet. Talk about that for some of those people in the audience who may be endurance athletes who think, well, walking up a hill isn't that difficult. Sure. I mean, look, I think uh, one of my favorite examples, I said I wasn't going to use names, but is Ken Rideout. I mean, Ken is an absolute animal, multiple time Kona. Um, he's 48, 49 years old and ran a 228 or 229 marathon last year. I mean, insane athlete. And he looked at this as like, hey, this is going to be an amazing environment. Uh, a lot of great people, but it's going to be a walk in the park. And, you know, a guy that can do an eight hour Ironman, realizing two to four hours in, there's no shortcuts here. This is going to be 18 to 20 hours. That's a lot of time. Even if I'm not going to the well, it's just a lot of time to put into something. And we've had numerous other elite, elite world record holding athletes come to the event. And you alluded to it. It's amazing for them to get to experience what what I saw after I finished an Ironman and I wasn't in an amazing time, like 11 hours, but you got to see a lot of the people that are what the sport is all about, right? Towards the back yeah. where maybe they only ran the first couple miles of the marathon. And then it's, then it's a long slog of four or five hours to get in and that get to have an elite athlete get to be on the mountain and continually lap the same trail and get to interact with the people that are growing right in front of them, I think is very powerful for them to see, wow, this is an aspect of the race that I'm missing. I'm mm -hmm. finishing a race, I'm going to get in a massage, then I'm going and eating dinner, and maybe I make it back to the finish line and see it. But then you're just seeing the finish. Here you actually see it play out for half a day while, yeah. while you're hiking. And because it's not a competition, I think it also allows uh, the, the elite endurance athletes to really enjoy and to give back. And so you can hike with someone and you can walk side by side and, and get to learn about them and know their story. And I think there's, there's a lot of bonding that happens because, you know, they remember when they first got into endurance sport and they want yeah. this finish line for other people. And now they're not worried about beating someone else. They're worried. They're, they're more concerned about how do I take this person and lift them up? So I think yeah. there's a lot of giving back that takes place, a lot of knowledge transfer that takes place. And then a lot of joy. I, I, I know I've talked to some of the elite athletes that we've had who said, you know, that's the most fun I've had in an event in a decade mm -hmm. because it allowed me to see what, why I originally got into this and it removed the pressure and I could just be me and I could just enjoy myself. And we've had athletes that came out and said they did when every other lap was a hot lap. So they walked one lap and then they redlined one lap and they walked one lap and they redlined one lap. But it was up to them to kind of create their own adventure and not have to live up to any preconceived notion of the time that they should do or splits or heart rate zones they should be at. They just got to come and be an endurance athlete and part of a community for a weekend where there was no expectations. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. Uh, having been there and being able to experience it for myself uh, and, and see the stories that are created. So the folklore and the kind of the stories that you talk about happening in the moment and over those 36 hours of did you see so-and-so do this or that person just did that and it kind of just creates this amazing community around the event and all these stories that come from that and that's very you, you guys really think about that process as well it's not just show up and hike up, up a mountain there is the dinners that are thoughtful there's the guest speakers the night before which really are the cost of admission for themselves in some regards tell us about some of the other experiences that you create to really foster that sense of community within the weekend yeah, I think when you're doing something like this, it's our goal to to create a life memory. Uh, my partner, his personal brand is called, you know, build your life resume. And it's about building this life resume, rich with experiences and people that you meet and very colorful and, and much different than a business resume. And this weekend, we want to be something that we know how hard people are going to train. We know firsthand 
a lot of what they're going to feel and go through. And you want to give them as many tools as possible. So our typical weekend, there's nothing typical about it. It's a Thursday to Sunday. And unlike other events, which I have a ton of respect for, and I love doing all these other amazing endurance events out there. I feel like when you arrive, it's kind of you and your crew and your support crew kind of again versus everyone else. And if you're lucky mm-hmm. enough to be on an amateur team, you have your team there and it's your team versus others, but it's, it's not as communal. And, and at 29 and 29, it's the exact opposite where you come and all the participants eat at a participant only dinner. And we have round tables and speakers that are participant only, but because it's limited to 250 people, I've been to other events that are participant only, but there's 5,000 participants there. And it's tough to get to know and meet people when the the atmosphere is so large and overwhelming. And here it's, it's, it's very small catered and, and cultured. And then you learn from amazing humans that will teach you skills that will actually help you on the mountain. And, and I think that's very, very beneficial. The event itself then kicks off and you have 36 hours to hike the mountain, take the gondola down and kind of, I say, choose your own adventure. You can go straight through, you go till 2 a.m. and get some sleep. Um, you can decide to hike till 10, sleep, wake up in the middle of the night, get out there. It's, it's really however you want to do it, but it's self-scored. And one of the mm-hmm. most unique things is that, you know, a lap for us, a climb makes it sound easy. And the mountains range between, you know, 1700 vertical feet and 2600, 25 to 2600 feet per lap. That's a pretty big hike. And so yep. for some people that may take them two, two and a half hours to do that hike. And we have a brand and a, a, a custom branding iron that when you finish your name is, is on a, what, what you almost think of a very old school leaderboard. If you think about golf tournaments and the masters, it's everyone's name and at Stratton it's 17 summits. And so you have 17 blank boxes. And as you finish, you take a cattle brand and you burn and sear into the wood your lap. And it's very visceral. You smell it. You can feel mm-hmm. it. And, and that feeling of, of you branding each lap and that being your board and your experience is something you keep track of. And it's amazing how much people on the mountain, when they're going through a rough spot, the thought of getting a brand that board of again is something that yeah. they look forward to. And then, you know, another awesome tradition that we have is the color red. Everything in our brand is, is black and white. And the color red symbolizes you're on your final lap. So you're, you're on pace to, to finish 29 29 and you wear a red bib penny with your name on it. And everyone on the mountain knows that you're making your final climb. You're making your final ascent. And I think that's big for me because the excitement that others get from seeing people get that it's not a sense of jealousy. It's not, look, they're ahead of me. It's what an amazing thing for them. And then I can't wait to get that myself. So I think just the red bib and the color red have become to symbolize so much within our community because we know what people go through to get that. And, and we want to, we want to hold that dear and treat that very special. Um, we've got a few of our friends here who are, who are watching and, and leaving some comments. So I want to acknowledge them. We've got our uh, good mate here, Britt and Barbie, two legends. What's up, I Britain? like that. Um, Chuck Wade's in the house as well. Legends. Yeah, Chuck's amazing. I like it. Um, and then we've had a couple of really thoughtful questions. So Sam Zerowal, um mentioned or asked about the thought process about choosing guest speakers. So you talked about people who are going to give you advice or give you thoughts that are going to actually help you on the mountain. Talk to me about what that's like. What are you? How are you kind of thinking about who those people will be and what type of messages you want to bring to the participants? So Sam's an amazing human and, and the, the stories that have come out of him and a close-knit group of guys from Texas that have forever uh, been a part of my life and, and 29 and 29 lore. Um, a really, really special person. Thanks for the question, Sam. You know, for, for me, it all starts with soul. So there's a lot of soul in 29 and 29 and those that speak really care about humans and are really good people. And while they may have incredible accolades as endurance athletes, they talk more about the emotions that they go through, how they manage those emotions, um, what they want for people to get out of the event. So a lot of choosing the speakers is first, you know, do they align with what we want here, which is community, uplifting people, bringing people up, lifting others up, not trying to beat them down. And, and so that's kind of the first qualification uh, that we look for. And then it's, will they be able to give anything practical? Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have an amazing Navy SEAL, Chad Wright, that talks about the power of the spoken word. And I think to a T, everyone who's been to a 29 and 29 and has seen Chad talk about, you have this elite level Navy SEAL who, who led SEAL teams on God knows how many missions in the most dangerous of, of places around the world, who is the most approachable, soulful, caring person. And we'll talk about 
how you can change the way you physically feel by just saying, I feel outstanding. And mm -hmm. when people hike past Chad, he'll say, Trav, how you feel? And you say, I feel outstanding. And there's no way you can't feel better from saying that. And that's the yeah. most immediate thing. And every elite level athlete knows that the voice in your head, as you call it, the inner voice is the most powerful voice you'll hear. Yeah. But just giving someone that one little trick and just seeing Chad's face on the mountain after he's taught you that or someone like Trisha Smith who will teach you breathing techniques to keep you calm when you get overwhelmed. Those are things you can learn on Thursday and put into place on Friday. Yes, is it amazing to bring an athlete who can tell you about something who may give you a training tip you can apply for your next event? Yeah. That's okay, but we wanna give people real actionable uh, tools for them to use the next day and also really feel a connection with that person. So the people that speak at our event, to me, are part of our team and, the, and they're part of our family. So everyone who's spoken is someone that I know has a message that aside from the event resonates with me as a human. And that's really like the first level where I say it has to have soul and they have to want others to, to get better through this process. And if they align there, then, then I think they're going to have a message that will resonate with our audience. Yeah. I have had the privilege of being able to bring some of these stories to life. And I, to a person, people talk to me about how life changing of an experience it is for them to be a part of this. But it's, I've also seen that in you. I've also seen that transformation in you over the last two years since we first met. Um, and it has changed your life and the ability to, you know, your wife to, to participate and, and get to Everest, to, to bring your kids along, to see these stories and to be able to create this amazing environment. I've seen that you know, bring up emotions in yourself. Um, Britain, our good friend, Britain, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, we had a really impactful conversation. He wanted to ask you, uh, what's one thing that you know now about 29 and 29 that you wish you knew before it launched or when it launched? I think year one, I really wish I would have known just how much people were willing to go through to finish the challenge. Because year one, we didn't respect the challenge enough. It was part party, it was part amazing food, it was part speakers, and it was part endurance event. And now it's an endurance event that has all those other components built around it to help support people in that journey. And so initially year one, there were just some scheduling things that we did that you know, we, we had people arrive on the same day the challenge started. We started the challenge Friday afternoon and people arrived Friday morning. You would never run a marathon and show up to the marathon city the day of the marathon. You would come mm -hmm. a couple days before. And so I think it was in structuring the event, Britain, where we learned first and foremost that we needed to do everything we could as event organizers and owners of the business to give people the best chance to succeed. Because once I saw what people were willing to go through to get 29.029, I needed to do all I could to make sure we had the best schedule, the best massage therapist, the best fueling options. And it wasn't about farm to table food. It was about really good comfort food I could grab and continue to climb, right? Mm -hmm. And so it just changed catering towards people actually achieving this event then, or achieving 29.029 really became the singular focus where it was part of the focus in year one. Have there been other shifts that you've noticed or other things that you've implemented that have been um, positive to the experience for people? Sure. I, I think, you know, we saw the way people interacted with uh, our speakers. So now our speakers are on the mountain hiking mm -hmm. with you. Give, give people more of an opportunity to interact with those that they saw be a positive influence today before. We saw people not know exactly how to prepare for the event. So get elite endurance coaches to create a five-month training program on a daily basis for three different level of athletes and then host, you know, bi-weekly calls where you can ask Q&A and feel like we're part of your journey the entire way through. So those were certain things where, again, it was all making an investment in the athlete to give them the best chance of success. We said, it's not just about being there for you on the mountain. It's about being there from the second that you sign up all the way through and then making sure we stay connected as a community afterwards, because it, it is a very tight knit group of people who have experienced 29029. And it's important that we continue to foster that that growth and community after the event as well. Yeah. Now, I know that there's a holistic approach that you take as you create these, uh, these experiences for people. So it's not just physical, as you've talked about the mental challenges people face, you talk about the training, you talk about the consistency, you talk about the coaching and the guest speakers. 
And I know that you're you're working on and you're about to launch something new that's going to really capture the entire spirit of 29029. And it's coming from a place of innovation. It's not coming from a, any other place other than how do we allow more people to have this experience without having to get everybody to a mountain on a certain date, on a certain weekend. Can you share with me a little bit about the, the new uh, innovation you have that you're best about to launch as well? Sure. You know, with 29 or 29, there's no substitute for being there that weekend. It, it goes without saying, look, my family's there. Um, my closest friends, you, our staff, I mean, and then our participants, that environment is electric and it's something you have to see and feel. And the stories that you bring to life uh, in participants' words are so important because we're not telling you what it's going to be like. They're sharing their stories authentically yeah. about what it's meant to them. That to me is the most important thing. There's a large segment of people who don't have the time. Um, maybe it's the travel. Uh, maybe it's a financial hurdle to be able to come and, and take part in this experience. And so for years, you know, I've been thinking about how do we bring our message? How do we allow others to do this? And over the past couple of months, a lot of finish lines have been removed from people. We've unfortunately had to postpone an event until next year. It was definitely the right decision, but it's certainly saddening for all of us in the community because we want people to have that experience. I have a, a large hundred miler that I'm supposed to run in September that I'm almost for sure is going to get canceled. And you see people missing out on so many things. And, you know, you're not sure exactly when they're going to return. Mm -hmm. And, and so for me, it was important to take what we have on the mountain and that, that feeling of community and positivity and small wins, right? Fitness is cumulative. My, my 10 year old right now through quarantine has decided he's going to do a hundred pushups, a hundred sit-ups and a hundred bodyweight squats every day. And he's done it every day for like 10 weeks now. And he's amazed yep. at how much stronger he is and how much easier it is. And he's been do having a weekly running goal. I'm not putting that on him. You know, I think he sees me do stuff. So it translates, but he sees the small wins stack up. And so one of the things that we really wanted to do with 29029 was have a 30 day challenge where each day we would take certain components from the event and bring them to an at home basis. You can't replicate the mountain, but yep. we can take Chad's message and say, hey, what's your one word going to be? What are you, what's going to inspire you today and inspire you for every day or for the next 30 days? Think of that word and have Chad give a talk and, and that be worth a certain amount of points. And the idea is that every day there's a challenge. These challenges do not take a long time, but the idea is that by doing them every day, you're gonna evolve into a better person and certain challenges are harder than others will be more time consuming than others. And those will take more points and we kind of equate points to vertical feet. So the overall goal is throughout the course of the month to accumulate more than 29,000 and 29 points in Everest within the month. So there's yeah. physical challenges, there's mental challenges, there's personal growth challenges, there's uh, a wide array of challenges. A lot of our speakers and coaches that we have on the mountain are gonna partake and, and be your coaches and kind of guides throughout these, these 30 days. And it's really to take some of what we do on the mountain and bring to you. And, and even for those that have climbed with us, I think it'll be a wonderful experience for them to just go through things together, albeit further apart. So I think there's there's a sense of, look, if, if a challenge is do an hour of exercise between 11 p.m. at night and 4 a.m., right? So no matter what, if you like to go to bed later or an early riser, there's going to be a point in the middle of the night where we're just asking you to exercise for an hour. Yeah. Well, everyone who does that together is going to remember that night. And they're going to be able to text about in the WhatsApp group and share and talk about what they did or what it was like putting on a headlamp for the first, first time or how weird it was going and working out in the basement when they normally would be sleeping. And so to give people new experiences and, and have them be able to do something no matter where they are quarantined or what state they're in or local rules they're in, give them something to do to provide positivity every day and, and work towards kind of winning the entire month. So yep. it's really about winning the day and then winning the month. Amazing. When does that start? When when can people kind of find out more about that or when does that kick off? Yeah, so we're kicking it off to 29 or 29 alumni uh, in Ju on June 1st. And we're going to go through with a small group of, of alumni there. Very excited. And then, and then to the public that will be released July 1. So we'll be selling that later in June. And, you know, that'll be a link from our website and, and our social media channels and everything else related to 29 or 29. And again, it, it's meant to be small curated impactful mm -hmm. a lot of communication with us and our team and uh really focus on you know a you versus you mentality of just just win the day every day yeah it sounds amazing um and britain britain once again he's here having a good time and, and thanks for being here britain he mentioned summit saturdays as a part of you know what the 2929 community has been and the interaction from the team has been incredible and i think that's 
this will be an extension of that from what I understand. It is sure. the team really showing up for, for everyone in the community, but the community showing up for each other and supporting each other through this as well. Um, talk to me about community for you. I know that through Leadville and your completion of Leadville, there was this group of guys that came together, um, the Boundless Eight, and you shared with me how important that was and how unique that was because it's hard as an as an adult to make new friends or to find a new community or immerse yourself in a community like that. Tell me about that experience of bringing those guys together and their families together and completing such an immense challenge uh, as a unit effectively. Sure. So the brief backstory is just in 2017 was the first 29029. And after that event finished, uh, a handful of gentlemen from Atlanta had all done the event independently. None of them knew each other. A couple of them were paired up in tents together. A couple of them met on the mountain, but by a flight home where many people were on the same Delta flight and then linking back up in Atlanta, realized that there were seven of them that kind of thought, look, we've done this. We've checked this box. What is next? And one of the gentlemen, uh, Daley Irvin, has, has actually rode across the Atlantic and is part of the two-man record holding team for fastest crossing of the Atlantic and had obviously done much bigger things in 29 and 29, had convinced everyone else, most of them had never run a marathon before, you can do a 100 miler and you can do Leadville, I've done it before. So I start getting calls and texts from different people with, within the Atlantic contingent that had done our first event saying, hey, we're gonna do this 100 miler Leadville, are you interested? You kind of brought us all together, it'd be great. And I was like, no. <laughs> like I just did my first marathon in an Ironman like two months ago. I'm not remotely interested in running 100 miles. And I started seeing this transform over the course of four to six weeks where it was actually gaining some momentum. And I have a list of things that I've written down that at one point in my life I want to do. And, and they're as crazy as be, be able to retire early enough to where I can be a ski instructor for an entire winter. And it's not easy to get to be a ski instructor. So you got to be a damn good skier to one of them I have run 100 miles. And yep. I looked at my wife and I was like, I need to ask for permission on this. And normally I'd rather beg for forgiveness and ask for permission. But I said, this is going to be a big <laughs> one, but I can't ever imagine taking this on and having seven other people to train with who mm -hmm. are part of the 29029 community or people that I want in my life. They're all great people. They're all great husbands, great dads. They're people I would want to only get to know better. And what better way to get to know them than I'm not playing golf. I'm not going out drinking. We're going to get up at 5 a.m. and run together. And that's really where it started. And you know, we signed up for the race in December and the race was in August. And for about seven, eight months, we all took on other than daily, our first 50K together, our first 50 miler together. We did training camp together. We got dinners together every month. We got our kids and families together after Saturday runs. And, and then we all tackled Leadville together. And to me, being able to go through that whole journey, the same way people go through 29 29, where they get to meet people in the community and, it's the journey and always people, people always say that. And I don't think until you've been through it, you really be, are you really able to recognize like all the valuable lessons you learn from the journey? I, I have so many life memories that came from training. Mm -hmm. The actual event weekend was amazing, but there was so much for me, anxiety of wondering how the guys were that I was training with. I mean, Leadville has like a 42% finisher rate. There's eight of us yeah. thinking that by math, probably four of these guys aren't going to finish. And then me finishing and not knowing how the other guys were doing um, was agonizing. So I think it's, it shows how much you care about others. And for me, it immediately translated to 29 or 29, how much I care and want people to finish this challenge and how I'll do anything for them. I felt the same way during Leadville. It was hard for me. Um, I couldn't be focused on them and focused on myself. We all had to focus on ourselves that day. But I very quickly felt like really part of a, a brotherhood and a bond and, and a team. I felt like we were really a team where... Um, I outfitted everyone. We called ourselves a boundless eight. We created a logo for it. And, you know, there were 50 family members who were all wearing the same gear. And so we, we had a presence there that week. And it's just left such an impact on me because those are guys that, you know, if something happened, they wouldn't call. They would just show up. They don't yep. send a text message on a birthday, right? Like we have, we have like a, a different level of connection because of what we've been through together. And, and that's what people get out of 29 to 29. If you've experienced the mountain together, you have a certain level of respect and bond for each other, then unless you've been there, you can't understand. And, and that's the way our group is that ran Leadville together. And, you know, seeing a couple of the gentlemen not finish, and then one of them go back last year to go and finish, and I had the, the, the privilege to pace him. Uh, 
seeing yeah. that kind of come full circle, people not finish and double down and train for a whole nother year and then go back and realize that finish line was really almost more special than the first year because we knew what it took to do it once and to, to dedicate a whole nother year of your life for a race you didn't finish is, is true and remarkable. And seeing Brian Davis do that was something that, that brought us together once again. So it was really a remarkable experience. Um, you mentioned it, how that has translated to you and how you show up at 29 or 29. I would say, and it, you know, I'm not ashamed to say this, you're probably one of the most caring, thoughtful, generous people that I've ever come across. And I wonder, you know, how has that grown in you since Leadville to show up now um, at 29 or 29 and at these events where you're, you're nonstop on those weekends to make sure that people finish and have that experience? Tell me about how that may have translated or is that kind of an innate thing that you've always had? No, look, I, I've always cared for people. My parents are wonderful, caring people. I married possibly the most caring, generous, thoughtful person on the planet, my wife, Stacy. And I think it's always seen, if anything, I'm asking her sometimes like, you need to focus on us a little bit more and, and not try to solve everyone else's problems, right? Like she's so thinking about other people. And, and I've always cared for people in my life and I've never hesitated to show people where my heart on my sleeve. I've never hesitated to show my emotions or to give a toast or tell my friends how much I care and appreciate them. But I didn't know how to treat that starting this. I've been an entrepreneur for a while, but I didn't know exactly the right way to show that at 29 and 29. I think going through Leadville yeah. and seeing the way that I could coach some people and seeing the way that I could just lead with my heart and authenticity. And that sometimes you have to tell people things they don't want to hear. Maybe it's telling people they need to eat. You know, I think back to year one, we had a, an incredible entrepreneur and an and athlete, a guy named Brad Weimer, who his goal was to raise $58,058 for a local charity in Austin. He said, I'm going to do it twice. Your goal is 29 to 29. I'm going to come out and do it twice. And I thought he was cocky. I was like, what is it with these people from Texas? You know, with the Lance Armstrong series going on. <laughs> I was like, what is this with this overconfidence? Like, why can't you just do it once? And he was doing it for charity. And you know, he was willing to donate a lot of his money and, and a lot of his donors money if he could do it twice. And it got to a point where, you know, it's, it's, it's 34 laps up Stratton Mountain. It's 1,749 feet a lap. Wow. And he'd gone straight through and it must've been 27, 28 hours. And he'd done, you know, somewhere around 27, 28 laps. I looked at him and I'm like, you have to sit down and eat. And if you don't, I'm going to have to take you out. Like it's, it's your own health means more to me than it means to you right now. And you need to stop. But to be able to show that care and tell a guy who's an absolute machine, you have to stop and eat. And he didn't want to, or I was like, or I'm not allowing you to climb anymore. Like, I'm just gonna take your bib. I'm not like you go anymore because something bad's gonna happen. And it actually made him rest, recenter. He got the calories that he needed and he went off and he finished it. And, and afterwards, you know, it empowered me to be like, look, I am caring after you and I'm gonna do what's in your best interest when you're at the event. I never wanna tell someone you need to stop, but if you need to eat, I'm gonna tell you to eat. If you need to hydrate, you know, if, yeah. if you need to see someone about some medical assistance, and sometimes people wanna push through some things and I want them to get to make their own decisions. But having been given that level, especially last year at Leadville where, you know, Brian just said, hey, look, whatever you say, I'm gonna do. And I think I immediately took that into play at both 29 and 29 events last year, right? Where I had a real confidence of knowing I could motivate people in the right way and be there for me when they needed them. And also at the same time, take those cues and step back and, uh, and kind of let them go through those times that they need to go through on their own and make sure that, that you let people work things out with their own space as well. So it's, it's, yeah. it's just trying to be, uh, have a very high level of emotional intelligence and, and knowing when to have the confidence to kind of step in and at the same time, knowing when it's best to kind of back off and let people make their own decisions as well. Yeah, very cool. We've seen it in action many times. And uh, Chuck Wade, who uh, who's in the audience here, mentioned on day two, he was in Utah uh, two years ago and you told him he needed to stay on top of his hydration and uh, it was a game changer, meant more than you know. So yeah. thanks for the shout out, Chuck. Yeah, so yeah, it happens amazing. and you don't know you don't know, you know, what or the impact you're going to have in that moment. But, you know, as you mentioned, the emotional intelligence to be able to assess that situation sure. is really important. Um, mate, this has been amazing. I do have three questions I want to finish with, but I also yeah. think there's so much more of your story that we need to share and we will do so in the future. Um, but I really appreciate you sharing more about 29 and 29, more about the 30 days to Everest uh, um, challenges coming up, more about your own story. Um yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's always great to connect uh, with you. Thank you. It's always, always. A um, thank you. So three, three questions to finish the show off. Um, first one, what's one thing that's changed for you during this isolation 
quarantine period that you want to keep once we go back to whatever the new phase of normal is? Wow, that's really good. <laughs> um, I think the one thing I want to keep, I feel like I've been very present and that, mm -hmm. you know, I've had this, I've had to make this clear distinction of I'm in my home office and when I'm not in my home office, I don't have my phone and I'm not going to be attached. And, and I think there's a sense of when you're an entrepreneur and you own your business and you're always trying to be responsive of if my wife and I are going to cook dinner with the kids, that's what we're going to do. I spend more time with my family than, than most people my age. And I love it. But there's a lot of times when I'm 80% there. And I think the, the real yeah. shift that I've made is if I'm going to be here, I'm going to be 100% here. And if, if, if that means I need to leave my phone somewhere, if that means I need to turn off notifications, I will because I don't want to be 80% here. I want to be 100% here. So I want to keep that going. And this is exactly why I love you. These these uh, <laughs> truth bomb knowledge yeah. of how to yeah. show up as a dad and a, and a husband yeah. is you know that's so impactful. So thank you. I think that's a really good one as well. I think it's really hard, it, it, particularly everyone's working from home. There's sure. kids at home. There's all of these challenges. And to you know, as an entrepreneur or someone who has your own business, you're always thinking anyway. You're always in your own head. You're always thinking about what's next, and um, probably even more so now when there's no separation. So I think that's really good advice, and that would be one that I would want to keep too so um number two uh what's one thing that you thought was important before this isolation quarantine lockdown period um that you're happy to leave in the past you know i i don't know that i'm happy to leave anything in the past i know that sounds ridiculous i i i think though that this return to normalcy or this return. I think that there's a way that the world was and there's a way that the world's gonna be afterwards. And that it's your ability to kind of adapt and not keep comparing things to how they were is important. So for me, I know when I moved to Atlanta, I compared everything to New York City. I lived in Manhattan for 10 years. The pizza was better, the restaurant scenes were better, the, you know, everything was better in New York, right? And it, it's really how much you need to be present to go back and just say, look, like, how do I make the best of this situation? And so for me, I don't, maybe what I want to leave are, are too many of those comparisons um, that uh, there's been a lot of amazing good times that have been had. And it's also OK to admit when things aren't great. And, and I'm a guy that's really overwhelmingly positive and has a lot of things to be very grateful for in my life. But I've also needed to admit a couple of times to my friends like this isn't easy. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it weighed on me very hard to to postpone an event. It killed me because I wanted to give people that mountain. I wanted to give them their red hats. I wanted to see them in their red bibs. I wanted to see them brand that board. And, and so, you know, I think for me, it's, it's being, it's really focusing on what we have now and not making those comparisons to how things were before, because um, that doesn't allow you to be present and it doesn't allow you to move forward. And I'm, I'm a big fan of moving forward and learning from your mistakes or learning, learning from situations like this about how to make yourself better. Yeah. Once again, check. I don't know. I don't. I think that Another was like a a, a, a a very much a politician's answer of like not really answering the question, but getting something across that you wanted to say. Uh, I, but you know, it works, so we'll go with it. Well, I think it's your your uh, your positivity that that probably doesn't allow you to have those those negative thoughts of what could have been yeah. or what was. I, it, it's insightful, and I appreciate it. So sure. we'll give you a point for that one. All right, um, I'll take it. Number three, uh, what's the what's been the most memorable moment of joy that you've had during this period? Uh, wow, there, there have been some good ones, honestly. Uh, I, I think I'll do two. I know I'm supposed to give one. I'm going to give two. So no one was just yet. One was just yesterday. Uh, my 10 year old each week I have a mileage goal. And so I don't know. We. 11 or 12 of quarantine now about uh, each week he said, can I run your last two miles or your weekly goal with you? And so there was, there was a moment yesterday where I did 11 miles really hard, but I needed to get 13 to hit my goal. And I came back to the house and grabbed Chase and we went out for two miles and it was just sheer joy. Was, he just wanted to spend time with me and uh, he wanted to see, you know, what it's like for me each week to push myself. And it hasn't been easy. You know, it's, it's been tough. I mean, it's, I'm a routine guy and to have your routine thrown out completely to have races that you're training for most likely not happen. Uh, I'm more empathetic to any of our athletes than, than I think most people would be because I'm, I'm going through it myself. Yeah. But I think for my son to see me each week say, hey, what's your mileage goal? He's my accountability partner. I love my coach Brent, 
when I told Chase I got 65 miles, he's like, oh, that's a lot. And for a lot of people listening, that's not many miles to run. But for me, it, it's a decent amount. And to have him know that he's going to join me for those last two, that's that's been a real moment of joy. And the other is uh, I created a family Olympics. And it was great for, you know, about we did 25 events. It's done. I think we need to do another one. But it was a real joy to have my wife participate in games. And I normally am playing with the kids because I come home from work and she was wonderful enough to be making dinner or making their lunches for the next day or, or taking care of the house. And I would get home from work and immediately get to go play with the kids. And yeah. she'd been with the kids through the day, but she wasn't playing games as a family. Um, and to see her get to play with us and mom and dad versus the kids was just real joy because every day it was one thing to look forward to of like, okay, when work's done, because we don't have a baseball practice to go to or because we're not, you know, traveling all over town to different games, um, we don't have no plans. So our plans are every day family Olympics. And I think the Hodelik House Olympics was a huge win because it allowed me to flex some creativity of creating events and doing fun things. But for us as a family to come together and compete uh, and, and for the most part, a, a joyous manner. It's not that there weren't some, <laughs> some tantrums uh, with an 8- to 10-year-old feeling like there was some unfair refereeing or things like that. But, but, but those two really stand out. And it, again, I mean, for me, they center around sport and being active and, uh, and spending time with the family. There's certainly been a lot of joy there um, amidst a, a, a certainly very trying time. Yeah. Um, I've been on the uh, on the receiving end of some of those tantrums with uh, some of the competitions we've had at your place. I've had the joy of right. taking on some soccer games and some uh, ping pong games with the kids uh, when I visited you. And uh, yeah, there's certainly win. some competition. <laughs> play to win. That's right. Um, that's right. Yeah, and I yeah, that's great. I wanted to reiterate to you. I appreciate everything you've done for me. I appreciate the opportunity to have you on the show. Uh, a lot of love and respect for you as a, as a man and as a, a, an entrepreneur, but most, uh, most importantly as a dad and a husband. So hats off, kudos, yeah, uh, big love. And I, I can't wait to uh, see you again at some point. Yeah. Well, I'll just replay it back. I think you've done a, a fabulous job of telling the stories that, that are out there on the mountain and pulling those stories. And you certainly pulled a lot out of me and uh so any opportunity to chat and uh get to have you pull, pull the best out of people something i'm always willing to be a part of so cheers thank you amazing good on you mate all the good best stuff. cheers thanks bud bye